Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is our first small group meeting of our Owls in Flight uh, virtual conversation series, where we discuss matters relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Jana Brady, I'm a geography lecturer at Southern Connecticut State University. I will act as moderator for this series. Um, I'm very interested in hearing your perspectives on the pandemic and how this massive world event has shaped your lives over the past few months. Um, I think I'd like to start by uh, getting a feel for what the pandemic response looked like in, in other countries. Uh, Maria, can you go first and tell us how Armenia has dealt with COVID-19? Um, yes. Uh, so. Everything here probably started like in the mid of March. Um, honestly, like initially, no one believed that it could reach Armenia. I don't know why it was like people were just living their lives, you know, like we can't imagine our days without daily huggings and kissing and stuff. And then uh, actually everything started when a woman uh, came if I'm not mistaken, from Italy, and she went to the like a major event, uh, and after that everything started. Like she was infected, and then all the other participants of that wedding um, got inf infected, and then the rest of the country. Uh, after that case, when we discovered that, we went to a complete lockdown. Uh, like we couldn't go outside and if uh, there was a need we should write a special like uh, papers with our names last names and what is the reason that we are going out and the reasons were to it's either grocery store or hospitals um, and this uh, lasted I guess for two or more more months we just finished the lockdown now we can go out of course with um, some measure uh, some restrictions that we should wear masks um, and i don't know keep the uh, social distancing there are still some um, uh, places that are not working like cinemas, I don't know, theaters, uh, but mostly we are back to our lives. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that like the number is still um, a lot, like we have 400 people per day getting infected and the whole population is like um, around 2 million. Um, that's why it's kind of a lot for us. Uh, but I, I think that Mm, we will get through this soon. Um, I have a question. Sure. So how did the um the government like did the government give out any type of fund like money for people mm -hmm. who were not um able to go to work? Oh, okay. This is a great question. Uh, actually, the first uh, help was to students because they couldn't pay their tuitions and like um, here most of their tuition was like get, getting from their parents. So if parents cannot work, they cannot pay their tuition and all the state universities were being paid by the government, especially to those students who have high uh, GPAs. Um, but like overall, um, like old people were getting uh, help but like yes the problem like they couldn't uh, support everyone of course but students were safe can you remind us what university you're at i'm sorry i forgot to um to tell you guys to tell us your yeah. name university. <laughs> i'm from american university of armenia uh, this is like um both american and we are also supported by the armenian government Maybe you have other questions? Yes, so um, I'm very curious about the papers that you had to like write what you wanted to do. Um, so where would you send them and how long would it take to get a response back? Yeah, okay, so um, when this just this idea just came uh we were just writing like we could write a papers like this and go out uh there are just criterias that we should include and that's it you can just take a paper and go out 
Then uh, there was another thing that you can print the paper. Uh, this is like an advanced thing. And after that, I guess in a week, we had the electronic version. So you can just um, electronically write everything, type, and then go out and just show your phone if the police stopped you. Oh, okay. So it's you didn't need like approval. It was kind of like, you know, in the United States, we, you have a hall pass or something kind of like that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, you just write and go. But I mean, if police stopped you and see that it's not the right place that you're going or something like that, they're like, go home quickly. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, did your country provide like, um, what is it called? Like, you know, how do you, like, you know, like, not really survival packs, but like, you know, like for um, people who can't go to the grocery store and stuff like that. Cause okay. yes, um, we had, of course we had like delivery that was free. Uh, and also we had uh, like volunteers just volunteers who were um, helping the government and other people uh, to help those who cannot physically go out. So probably this is it. Actually, the online system was another problem because like a lot of universities were not physically ready to uh, this transition from face to face to online classes. Um, that's why, like, I guess education was also suffered a little bit at this point. But um, I guess we're planning to have another online semester uh, for the fall. Um, that's it. <laughs> I mean, we are we are getting back as as much as we can. Tamara, can you uh, tell us what's going on at Southern or in, in the United States? Definitely. So um, we actually went on lockdown around March, like again, I guess around like uh, around spring break. Um, it was around right, right then. It was around um, spring break, and what happened is we just received an email, and <laughs> we were just told, "Hey, you know, this is spreading, so we, you guys, need to, you know, um, probably go home and." Um, go home. <laughs> um, but we were put on, it was like a, a sort of kind of like it started as like a, okay, it's you, you know, stay home, social just um, social justice, social, social distance. And then um, after that, it became, it began, like began becoming more, um, I guess, firm, as in like, everything started shutting down, like everything was on lockdown. Like it was no, only essential workers could go outside. Um, if you were a non-essential worker, you were advised to stay home. Um, the hospitals were very overwhelmed. They were, I don't, I don't think that um, our hospitals were prepared for the magnitude of this pandemic, um, especially in uh, let's like, the hot spots around um, the country. So we saw a lot of, we didn't have enough like PPEs and stuff to like protect ourselves. So it was, it was pretty, it's pretty bad that way. And um, I'm trying to like recap. It's been so long. I've lost track of time. Like it's just, um, I can also add in whatever <laughs> if you need help. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so basically, from my end of things, um, well, first of all, I think we were more prepared than yeah. other countries because we saw this coming. And so in New York City, they had the nurse ship come in um, from the military, and they actually didn't really need it. They did have um, a few patients, but it it was more intended to uh, separate people in the hospitals who were there for different reasons from COVID patients. Um, and so it did help in that regard with spread to people who might have been immunocompromised. Um, and then my sister's girlfriend uh, is an essential worker. She's uh, an EMT. So she was definitely... Um, 
coming into contact with quite a few patients. We actually had her um, isolate at my apartment. Um, so I moved back with my family, which I was actually very excited to do. Um, and, you know, she definitely saw quite a few cases in the hospitals. Um, you know, I think there's still a pretty steady stream, but I do believe we did a pretty good job of kind of flattening the curve. Uh, and we didn't need anything official to go outside. Like I was going on hikes and runs and like anything in nature I could do. Uh, you know, we were also able to go to the grocery store, but in my town, um, there were two grocery stores that were doing, uh, there were a few that were doing delivery, but there were also some that did curbside pickup. Um, and that, like, I don't think anyone in my family even went to a grocery store for maybe like three months. Yeah. Um, and even still, we hardly go. Uh, you definitely have to wear masks still. It is interesting because I think a few people take that a bit more as a suggestion. Um, which is not awesome, but, you know, in stores, they'll have arrows on the floor with tape that point yeah. the direction you're supposed to go, and that can be very confusing, yeah. so <laughs> I try to stick to it as best as possible, but you'll see me, like, go down an aisle and, like, turn around and <laughs> try to go a different way, and um, I, they also, you know, have a lot of hand sanitizer available, um, and I remember in that first week, so that was, two days before our spring break, I definitely thought that we were going to stay in until spring break. Um, so those like two days. And then I think in that time, basically my family was trying to do everything we could to prepare for things shutting down and maybe not being able to go into the grocery store or something like that. So, uh, basically like I got my hair cut that like Friday before we went into lockdown, we got Lucky. a bunch of yeah, we got I haven't gotten my haircut since though. <laughs> like, um, um, I like I don't know if I like uh, fully agree that like we did a good job. Like, I feel yeah. like there, there's what we could have done better. Like, I feel like we could have done better in the sense of like providing the um, essential workers with the necessary, um, you know, protective gear and stuff like that, and even with. Um, like our government gave us like one stimulus package. Like it was basically like everyone, I guess, who paid their taxes got like a $1,200, depending on your, I guess it fluctuated, the, the amount fluctuated depending on your, how much you got paid and stuff, so on and so forth. So it was like a one-time thing. And then that honestly finished within like, I don't know, we, we got that from like what, 8th March? It, everyone everyone got it at different times yeah. so like I think my parents only just got theirs a few weeks ago and then some people got them a lot earlier and then same with unemployment as well um a lot of people were going on unemployment and like my boyfriend had applied in March and had to reapply mm -hmm. um like last Friday because they just never like contacted him put anything through like you know it's it's definitely a tricky system um, sorry oh. I have a question yeah well I've seen like in the tv here that for example in United States each like region well I don't know exactly the name it's government like um, had different measures and different things. I mean, not the whole country like did the same thing. What do you think about this? Do you think it would be better if all the country, I mean, did the same measures or uh, like the way it was done? Or I don't know if I explained myself. Yeah. Um, oh. So you're talking about like if America, like everybody, like all the different states in America had done the same thing? Yes. Okay. Like, do you think it would have been better or I don't know? So in my opinion, I feel like it would have been better if we all were on one page because mm -hmm. like there were some states that implemented 
a um, stay at home order, but then there were some states that didn't. So you would have people who would travel from, let's say, New York and then travel to another state to like go get a drink or something or go out to like, you know, do something. So in that case, in my opinion, I'm like, okay, that's basically just spreading it across state lines. You know what I mean? Like if you had um, a stay at home order set for every every um, in every state. But President Trump was saying that the issue with that is there are some states that are like, I guess, some people in certain states that they aren't exposed to it. You know, like if they're in a, a rural area, they're not in contact with any anybody outside of their mm-hmm. immediate um, place. So why put them on a stay at home order? But which I understand his view, but I do feel like. It's like a sort of kind of like a herd, like a herd immunity. If you protect everybody else, like you will also be protecting that small community. You know what I mean? And um, I feel like Connecticut, New York, and I think New Jersey. We did. It was three states that I, like we all worked together. Um, so we did the same um, social, not social distancing, the same social distancing, distancing measures was like put across the whole country, but we did those same stay at home order that was given through all those, those three states because we're so close to each other. And it was fair that people would be traveling from one place to another to go to a bar or something. So all the bars were closed, every like movie theaters, everything was just closed. But yes, I do say if things were if there was a, a, everyone was on the same page, I do feel like, you know, we could have gotten this under control a little bit faster. Yeah, I believe the same as you, because, for example, in Europe, they haven't, like, worked together, like, the European Union um, said, okay, its country uh, can do, like, what uh, the country feels, it's better. Okay, yeah, that's great, but, for example, we are really close together, and... Uh, I mean, uh, most countries in Europe were like locked down, uh, like with uh, restrictive measures. But maybe now, like when we are starting the summer, it is a uh, really complicated, like in terms of um, travel, tourists, and the European Union doesn't have like uh, common measures, like to say, okay. We can open uh, boundaries this day. All the countries, no, they are saying uh, maybe there are some countries who open uh, that day and others not. And I think it's very complicated. And I don't know. I believe that because we have never been or seen something like this before. Yeah. So it's so difficult to assess the issue um, in the best way possible because it's, it has never been seen before and co- like corona, the, the, the coronavirus is so different than every other virus I guess that we've seen so it's like there's times where you might that we hear okay if you get it once you know you're immune to it but then it's like there's so many different strains now you know what I mean like it has changed so many times because we're just learning that basically the strain the strain that came to New York which basically did wreak havoc was from Italy was a strain that came over from Italy and um the strain that came from uh from Wuhan to Italy is it it totally changed itself so it's like this thing has the like is has the capability to change so quickly how can we get it under control? It's it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And like for me, for example, I I was trying to protect myself so like listen, I took every measure, I made sure I wore masks, everything. But one day, I, it was a couple of days, I and I had to go to the hospital um to get a physical done. And I forgot my mask. I forgot my hand sanitizer, forgot everything. And in that same um, vicinity that I was in, they were testing COVID patients. So I'm in that environment. And I kid you not, within a week or so, my, I, I, my, like I had a fever that was beyond my, like it was beyond me. I never had a fever like that before. And 
I felt like I wanted to die. It was literally like, I was so scared. I started thinking like, okay, am I going to die? Like, is this what death feels like? And, um, like I'm, I'm Jamaican. So we believe a lot in like herbal medicine. So I was drinking a lot of like garlic tea and ginger tea and all these different types of teas. And, um, I can say that I had probably had symptoms for about a good two weeks. Um, and then after that, I just totally and completely lost my sense of smell and taste. It just disappeared. Like I couldn't taste food. I couldn't smell anything. I was literally making something one time and it was burning, but I was in the living room and it was burning. And I'm just like sitting there, not knowing that it's burning. And my family's just like, you're burning something. I'm like, no, I'm not. Nothing is burning. And they're like, you don't smell that. I'm like, smell what? Like, I can't smell anything. But it, it's, I can say that is the worst thing. It is the worst thing. Like, I was, the only thing I, I didn't get, thank God, was the pneumonia. Because I, I was doing much. Like, I was basically quarantined to my room. And they, my family would just come and bring food and leave it at the door and knock. And, like, I'll go and get the food. It was like a prison, literally. It was like living in a prison. Um, Like, to me, this this pandemic came and shifted my whole life because it happened around my birthday. Like, everything, the whole wave coming to America happened around my birthday. I had a whole plan to go to Puerto Rico. And literally the day before leaving um, to go to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico shut down. They basically locked off all travel to the country they said nobody from outside can come inside if you come in in the country you cannot leave like it's you won't even be able to do anything because they locked everything down it was yeah i i I just hate this i i honestly hate this but hey gotta live with it if there aren't any more questions um maybe we can see i know but here maybe you can tell us about the lockdown in south africa i think i recall um, South Africa had some of the most extreme lockdown measures. Um, hi, yes. Um, I think that the, the president acted swiftly uh, at the beginning. We, um, he, we went into complete lockdown. Um, the initial plan was 21 days. And as predicted, that, that it didn't solve the problem, obviously. And then... Um, Eventually, after the 21 days, it, um, he extended w- w- the um, the lockdown. To, um, by the way, it was for the entire country. And then, if it, you, you know, the, you reach a point where you have to decide or you have to balance certain interests. And I think the, the most challenging one for us was um, the fact that, um, um, you know, the, the economic interests versus um, safety. And, and all of that. So then eventually there was a plan uh, set out um, so that we could, lockdown could be, I don't know, how, how should I say this now? Basically we, we were um, locked down, we, we, we had less levels now of lockdown. So level five was the strictest. Then we moved on to level four and level three, um, allowing certain people to go back to work and um, certain stores, to open, for example, um, in level five, um, which was which started at the end of March, they, I think it was only, obviously essential um, services and we could only purchase groceries. But <laughs> I remember I had uh, I had this problem with the with the with the um, what what essential items actually are because. Um, we had to do our examinations. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I know I'm eating the academic uh, topic now, but just slightly. Um, basically, I needed to purchase a laptop, and laptops weren't essential items at the time. <laughs> and obviously, I needed to do work, so then there was that. I remember sending an email <laughs> complaining about it, but to no avail. Um, but yeah, we're on level three now. Um, group meetings are still um, prohibited. 
Um, but I think almost everyone is allowed to go back to work, but with strict measures in place, obviously, um, we are permitted exercise. I think in level four, you could only exercise for a, I think there was a, um, I, can't, I don't remember, sorry, I don't read, just um, by the way, I don't read a lot of the news because <laughs> um, propaganda, yeah, <laughs> um, so it's difficult, so I don't easily believe a lot of the things that I read. Um, I prefer to do my own research or um, experiments, let's put it like that. Um, but of course, there are certain things that you can't avoid. Um, so level three, yes. So now um, we can exercise and we can purchase clo winter clothing. But um, yeah, that's but a lot of things are still limited. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's mainly because that we, the fact that they are, it's not that our cases have decrease that we are moving to um, more lenient levels in terms of lockdown. It's more that, that um, like I said, um, about the balancing of interests. Um, some pe I, I remember reading um, some people saying that um, we are going to die of hunger before we die um, of the coronavirus. Um, those are obviously topics for debate, which I won't go into now, uh, but yeah, well, yeah. I don't, I don't want to give my opinion on it, but that those are the facts. Yes. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Oh, I'm from the University of the Western Cape, by the way. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, I thought it was funny that you mentioned that you don't read a whole lot because, like. You know, before we started this, I Googled, like, what are the <laughs> COVID measures for Connecticut? <laughs> Just because I, you know, I hear a lot from my family and, you know, they're reading up on stuff. But I think from the beginning of all of this, I kind of found that the best thing to do for myself was, you know, focus more on what was going on in my own life rather than reading a bunch of the news. Um so <laughs> you're not alone and not quite knowing. Um, I was worried that all of you would know the exact details. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering, so you said you couldn't purchase a laptop. Like, were you guys not able to do online orders of unessential items? No, we were allowed to do online orders. And that was the, that was the weird part um, because we're allowed to do online things, but we couldn't purchase the laptops during the lockdown but i know that when the when uh, the, um when it was announced that we were going to be in, put, put into lockdown then we were given two days to um two days before it actually took place so then i would assume that that those two days were to purchase such things but it didn't make sense either also because what if for example your laptop had broken during the lockdown and you still need to purchase one um, so yeah, those were the things. But okay, I think I, we can purchase now ones now. But it's just that because I remember looking on Take a Lot to, to see if I could purchase one, and then I couldn't. So I don't know. That was just weird. Um, but okay, I'm not a politician, or so. <laughs> hmm. Actually, I have a question. So what is the situation now? How, how are you doing? What what are you doing now? Is there, are you done with coronavirus or it's still going on? Oh no, it's definitely going on. Um, I think our cases are still e increasing on a daily. I'm not exactly sure what the statistics are, but <laughs> um, but we do have a lot. Um, it's quite a bit actually, and it's it doesn't. Like I said, I haven't been reading. I don't read a lot of the news, but I occasionally check. And um, it looks like it's still um, increasing the cases and um, our deaths. I, th it, I think, OK, I don't want to I'm not going to speak about the statistics because I don't want to get my numbers wrong. Um, but no, we, we, um, it's still bad. Definitely. Um, yeah. But here, I'm going to jump in and help you. Um, lockdown measure five, level five. If um, I don't know if you recall, but you weren't allowed to, restaurants were completely closed. Um, all shops were completely closed except for 
grocery stores and non-essential items in the grocery stores were blocked off. Um, yes. You were not allowed to purchase two big items. Cigarettes and alcohol were banned. That was a big deal yes. there. Uh, you weren't allowed to leave your homes for any exercise, for any purpose whatsoever, you weren't allowed to leave. Um, so they, they, they really took uh, level five quite seriously. And, and now they're phasing that out a little bit, but uh, you guys had to, uh, had to go through some, some really difficult times there. But I think maybe oh. somebody else has a question. Yeah, I have a question. So you just stated that um, the non-essential items within the grocery store were like, bar was it ba barred off or like you couldn't purchase those? Yeah. Wait, so yeah. how, like <laughs> if you're in the, I don't get that because like if you're in already in the grocery store and the item is there, like why can't you purchase it? Do you know? What was the reasoning behind that? Um, yeah, that's what I think the whole idea of it was to. Um, I think they, they, they wanted to if, for example, in an ideal world, I think they would have closed if they if it was possible, I think they would have closed all stores. But obviously um, people need essential items. So but the more items you have, the more customers you're going to have, which means there are going to be more um, people who want to shop. Um, I, rec I, I know in my area or district, whatever you want to say, um, I um, at, at the grocery stores, there, there were queues which extend, which which went all outside of the mall, and and ex it extended. Um, it was it was long lines to stand uh, that we had to stand in. So you can only imagine that if you had non-essential items in the store as well, then the lines would be longer because some people would come for unnecessary things, whereas other they would make the queues longer for those who actually wanted um, the essential items. You understand? Yeah. Got it. Um, that, News, can you share from Spain? Yes, I can. Um, well, in Spain, um, the coronavirus was like it affected to a uh, lots of a uh, population. So we really had a uh, um, lot of restrictive measures. Um, for example, we just could go to the shops to get essential items. And then, um, same as in South Africa, uh, we had uh, long queues. And for example, in my town, uh, not in the cities, but in the small towns, you couldn't uh, get inside the shop, for example. Um, they put like a crystal um, thing and just as you just said, okay, I want this, this, and this, and they um, uh, made like the shopping for you and they give it to you and you went home. And then we also had uh, the papers like in Armenia. Um, you couldn't write them, but you asked like for the um, uh, people in the factories or uh, like where you went to work and they give it to you and you show it to the police if they stopped you. And then uh, if we talk about like the, um, uh, now that we are uh, getting again into like normal life, uh, we have like four levels from one to four and four is like a uh, normality and one is like um, um, confinement and then um, it's like they are opening restaurants, they are opening things, and people can go out. At the moment, uh, in my town, we are in number two, and we are allowed to have meetings uh, until like 10 people. And then um, uh, you can go and do a sport, go to a restaurant, and things like that. Yeah, so if you have any questions. Um, did your government like give out any um, like money to the like to their residents or stuff like to um, not yet but they have like um, like in the government um, 
they have like um it's like um i don't know how to say it <laughs> like it's like in a bowl that it says okay um millions of euros to go to um, uh, families who um, who need the money or maybe to factories or um, to buy essential items and uh, like when the lockdown will be like uh, op uh, like open again uh, the government will give the money to the people who is like in bad conditions but it's strange because there is a lot there are a lot of people who is like in bad conditions so i don't know if will be like enough money to all the people who need the money i don't know yeah and one last question for me at least um is for you so um if you were in a governmental position like what would you have done differently for um your country pertaining to the pandemic? yeah well i think the the government has done like good things but also bad things uh, maybe when the the spread like uh, the virus got in china like at the beginning we were like, oh no, the virus won't come to Spain or Europe or is there, it won't came out. So at that moment, the government uh, should have thought, oh, maybe the virus can't come, maybe we can buy masks and things because the virus came and we didn't have anything. And uh, we got like really in a lot of infected people because they didn't prevent like what this could have done. Well, I don't know. Um, I was actually wondering how available were masks or other protective um, equipment? Cause like I know in my family, we were like sewing masks. Um, so what was that like for you guys? Okay, yeah, at the beginning uh, we didn't really have masks because you went to the chemist and you say oh can i get a mask and she was like no no i don't have masks so and the uh, the doctors and all of that stuff uh, they were like covering with the same mask like the same day and i don't know they should have bought more masks but it was complicated because um all was closed and I don't know, they should have like thought about masks and all of that. But now uh, we have loads, so, <laughs> but. Um, may I ask a question? So yeah. uh, what, what were the measures done to those who like didn't obey the law? Were there okay. any points? Yeah, they had penalties, like the police was, okay, why well, you are not here and like, faults of and money and things like that but i think that there was some of the population who has been really conscious okay we are we have a virus we should stay at home but uh, there was another part who was like yeah but this won't get to me and things like that but i don't know jonathan hi hello Hi. Can you, um, can you can you share uh, your university and um, what the lockdown measures look like in Chile? Okay. Sorry, my English is not good, so I speak for the best for you. <laughs> okay. My name is Jonathan. I live in Chile. My university is Universe uh, Santiago de Chile University. So I study architecture. So uh, a situation in Chile is. I don't know, it's normal, but the, obviously the most store important is closed. So only open to the necessary store for you, for the people uh, buy, buying the, the food. So I don't know, it's, it's weird, but uh, the people uh, stay in, in the, 
the street. So the go government uh, no no have to explain the the necessary uh, res necessary reward for the people. So actually, uh, Chile chain have a very a uh, very very effective um well while jonathan is is sorting that out um he is a member of an indigenous community and i hope he can uh come back and talk to us a little bit about that because i know i'm very interested in hearing how um, the virus and lockdown measures were received by indigenous people in Chile and and how it affected them. I know in the United States it's it's been devastating for our indigenous populations. Jonathan, can you sorry, tell us? Sorry, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit <laughs> about um, the pandemic response uh, in your your indigenous community? Yes, but I actually I make community indigenous people uh, is in north of Chile. Okay, I live actually I live in Santiago, is the capital city in Chile. So it's impossible for me to travel to here. But I the the um, the last month my grandma de uh, dead dead. So the I don't know. It's complicated for the government. Uh, not had to implement to security for the other people and the most important people is the community uh, indigenous people. But in uh, in general, is the older people. So don't speak to Spanish. Uh, the older people only speak to your language, so it's complicated for the the information for to to reward the coronavirus is only in Spanish. So it's complicated for the, when you need to explain the, for example, for my grand grandparents, uh, you need to go to to street for it's. Uh, it's complicated for your life, but the grandparents don't understand for, sorry, I need to go to my uh, animals, so I go to the, my house, but this is older people for understand for what is the situation actually, but never explain for, the, for them. I think that that's probably a big problem in multicultural and multi multilingual countries in general. You have to, um, you know, find a way to reach all of the communities. Thank you for sharing, Jonathan. Um, Amir, can you join us and uh, tell us what university you're from and um, let us know what the lockdown measures were like in Malaysia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, finally. <laughs> Okay, so hi, my name is Amir and I'm from Malaysia. I'm from UITM, yeah, UITM di Hatiko. Okay, so in Malaysia, we have been quarantined since March and we have like five phases of quarantine. So for each phase, it's like two weeks of testing. So we for the five phase, we have like the observation phase, the uh, discrimination, uh, the the recovery phase and then the sanitization phase. So we have all these five phases work differently. So just now in like in South Africa, the the maximum uh, security for the for the uh, phase is actually in the fifth phase, right? But in Malaysia, the tight the tightest uh, security is in the first phase, the first and the second phase, because our country we like the government. They shut down all the entries to Malaysia, and then they shut down all the movement from each states. 
So you're kind of like, for example, you're studying in, you're studying in KL in Kuala Lumpur, and then you're you're going to stuck there until the end of the, the end of the quarantine. So you cannot move away, even though it's not your house. So in Malaysia, the the first step that they take is actually to, in uh, to not to discourage movement. So that's the first one. So by doing that, they actually they had like some roadblocks. So even if you're going to the grocery, you're going to pass through uh, roadblocks. So every time you pass through a roadblocks and they say like you want to go to a grocery, but this is like 10 kilometers away from your house. You're, you're not just going to be like, the police won't tell you something like, oh, just go home. They'll be fine you. They will give you a compound of 1,000 ringgit Malaysia. Those 1,000 ringgit essentially is similar to like 200 US dollar. So each time like you pass through a roadblock and then you say that you want to go to the grocery, but it's like 10 kilometers away from your house. And then the police are going to find you for for lying or something. And then uh, just similar like you're uh, just like in the States. In South Africa, actually, all the grocery stores are open. All the restaurants are only open for takeaway. There's no dining. And then uh, all the stores are open for the essentials. And we also provided, like, you can say a stimulant package. And the stimulant package is divided through the, uh, through the, we divided the, uh, the civilization into like five categories. Those are like the B40, T20. The B40 is like the most um, under which, under which uh, community where they didn't have, they didn't, uh, have, their salary doesn't exceed 1,000 ringgit. So they are like the, uh, the poorest of the community. So for them, they have a different stimulant package. They have a certain amount of money. And then for the middle tier part, they have a certain amount of money. And then for the upper tier part, they have a certain amount of money. And we also have stimulant package for the ones like, for university students like me, I have my own stimulant package. And then they also give um, stimulant package to, um, to people like who is single, who is in a relationship, who's already married, who's without how, how many kids. So those kind of things are taken into consideration before they divided the money. So yeah. Yes, again thing. And now, right now, we are in the sixth phase because like all, uh, before this, we couldn't move between states. But now, in uh, just on 10 June, we were allowed to move between the states already. So right now, like if you want to go out to meet your girlfriend or you want to eat dining in a restaurant, yes, but we still practice social distancing. And right now, the current cases in Malaysia, it's very low. Let me see. Um, as of today, we have confirmed of 8,000 cases. Uh, if you didn't know, actually, Malaysia is very, uh, very small. So we only have 8,000 uh, 8, 8, confirmed cases. And so far, we have recovered like 7,000 cases. And our death was only 100 cases, 118 cases. That's like 1.18% 1 1 of the country population. So we have a very uh, low death rates. And yeah, the government is actually it's actually quite funny if you if you know about Malaysia political thing in Malaysia, it's kind of funny because we just had our eight prime minister on February, and then the quarantine was commenced on March. So I mean, can you imagine like the hassle that the prime minister have to go through just to put the quarantine in place? So yeah, that's the thing about Malaysia. Amir, can you um, can you tell us if you if you happen to know what the government did to protect the indigenous people in Malaysia, the Orang Asli? Okay, so for the indigenous uh, people, each indigenous people uh, in each village they have like the chief of the village. So for the chief of the village, they are they are the one uh, because the indigenous village is quite far from from the city or from the town, so they are very isolated. So the first step uh, the government did was to inform the indigenous village, uh, the indigenous chief, to shut down all the entry to the village. Because uh, we know that, like uh, Jonathan said, uh, they are they are very uh, they had a very hard in understanding the 
the current situation in it. and explaining to them is a, is a also a bit of a bit hard so the first step they did it actually just to inform the chief village to shut down all the entries and exits of the village and then uh, they provided uh, some kind of um, it's not it's not the same as the stimulus package the stimulus package is like a um, monetary monetary helps but for the indigenous phase we provide them some kind of uh, for example uh, your essentials like you want to buy like some sugar some egg and stuff because they couldn't go, go out to the city and then they prohibit people to come in also so there's no um, there's no movement for them to buy their essential to the city so we just provide them all the essential that they need at each village so yeah Um, so in terms of the barrier, like the blockades, um, where the police would find you for, you know, any kind of movement to go get what you needed, uh, did you have delivery from restaurants where they would face similar things if they were trying to just deliver to you? Uh, yeah, um, at... At, at first, it was okay to just let them go through it, to pass through it. But then some of the deliveries, they took advantage of it because the police didn't check them. And then there's this one time, like after one month, the police checked one of the uh, motorcycle and then they discovered like some drugs in it. So they were using it for drugs. So it, it was because all economies are like, you can say are put on hold. And so that's the illegal, illegal uh, business. So they use the, uh, they use the uh, delivery, but they are not the official delivery. They just imitating themselves to be delivery, and then they just pass through them. And then there's this uh, after after that single incident, every every uh, motorcycle rider or every uh, driver they had to pass through the uh, the checkup point first before they deliver their stuff. So yeah, uh, uh, can I ask a question actually to the states because I want to ask the questions where you guys were so enthusiastic in telling stories. <laughs> okay, um, uh, can I know like what's the current uh, issues about the COVID cases in the states? Like, is it still rising or put on hold? Um. So actually, after Memorial Day weekend, uh, which is you know generally when everyone is first enjoying summer, um, I think there was an increase. I saw about 21,000 cases um, oh. since Memorial Day weekend um, in May. Uh, <laughs> and I know that, you know, like it hasn't really been two weeks since all the protesting has started either. Um, and, you know, First things first, like, I totally support the protesting. Um, I'm personally not allowed to go because yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. live with my parents and my mom would kill me. <laughs> um, yeah. if, you know, just in terms of, like, not wanting me to get infected. Um, so w we still have to see the fallout um, from that. But prior to to this you know we're we're in the phase of opening more um we can go to restaurants but we only sit outside um prior to that it was a pretty steady number of cases i think it might have been decreasing a little bit but my uh, friend's dad who works in the er as a doctor um he said that you know it was it was pretty steady there weren't there wasn't an increase, in, but there also wasn't necessarily a decrease. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, who knows yeah, in the future? I, I saw the I saw the protesting, and so I was quite worried because the the pandemic is still ongoing. So yeah, yeah, like yeah. it it is um like what Danielle said, basically that you know there has been a huge um there has been a, a an increase that we've seen since the Memorial Weekend because a lot of people um, went to like pool parties and weren't following social distancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh-huh. and not wearing masks. And it turns out that um, an individual was actually infected and went to um, like set three, about three different events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So they were advising people who were who went to those events to go and get tested. And like what Daniel said, like we don't know what um, is to come from the protesting pertaining to the coronavirus. And we will just have to wait to see in the um, upcoming weeks, honestly. Um, And I was reading something. I believe it was the, I believe it was the New York Times. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on this. But Mm -hmm. it was basically saying that the U.S., the U.S. is projected um, coronavirus is supposed to go like skyrocket within the coming months. And um, I feel like we're going to go right back into lockdown, honestly. Uh Yeah. Well, uh, now we've heard about lockdown situations in all of our countries. I think we have maybe one a time for about one question. Um, so we've heard a lot about restrictions from our government, for our businesses, for ourselves, for our communities. Um, and and I think COVID nineteen can have a really has had a really negative impact on on our psyche almost um what acts of kindness have you guys heard about during the coronavirus uh can i start first please (laughs) okay uh the act of kindness it can be by anyone right absolutely yeah okay all right so like um back in my university actually i was quite active in Involving myself with the homeless people, and I also live in KL, so it's very near to my house. And like I could just say, in part of my house, there's a lot of homeless people. Uh, so the the first in the first phase for the two weeks, every actually uh, before the quarantine, every day you you will see that like, people going out in the middle of the night to give food. And then you have this soup kitchen providing food for the homeless, and then in the morning and stuff. So they are, you can say that they, are, they had something to eat every day. But when the quarantine cases have uh, happened, uh, all the NGOs, all the voluntary stuff, they couldn't go out. The police won't let them. And, and there's this one case where uh, a volunteer, he rushed through the checkpoint and then go through the middle, in the middle of the KL just to provide food from the homeless. But then he got caught for it because he wasn't uh, obeying the law. And uh, after that case, it took into consideration for the government and then they changed it. They say something like, okay, right now, uh, we assemble all the homeless people in one place. It's a one lockdown place. And then we test them for COVID and then we provide them food for the whole quarantine. You see, now all the homeless people in, uh, in the city all have places for shelter and food for free. And after a month after that, all those employers came to the shelter to provide them job. So it's like a one do thing. Uh, you can say that uh, all those uh, all the homeless people fate change with a single event. So right now, uh, most of them they have jobs, and then uh, they still live in the shelters. And then the government are still going to provide the shelter until this COVID ends. Because they, they wouldn't uh, want them to wander around on the streets and then to have COVID and then to walk around again to spread the COVID. They don't want it. So, yeah, I think that's the really good part about, about this quarantine thing because people, all the attentions, they were concentrated on, on the homeless people, like one of the events. So, yeah. That's really wonderful. Good job, Malaysia. <laughs> Does anybody else want to share? Well, I um, heard a story about a teacher who um, had a student who, whose parents were uh, pregnant. They were going to have a baby. And um, the mother had COVID and the father had COVID and the baby was born and the baby needed somewhere to go that was COVID free. And the teacher took the child in and has looked after the child for um, maybe a month or so while her parents are recovering from COVID. And I thought that was very heartwarming, you know. Um, Everybody in in this time, we're all, there's 
especially teachers. Teachers have so much going on. They've turned their homes into classrooms. They have their own children that they're trying to teach. And on top of it, they, um, you know, extended their, opened their home to a, a child who is in need, if just temporarily. So I thought that was a really wonderful, wonderful thing to hear. Um, if anybody else has anything mm -hmm. they'd like to share. Yes, uh, I would like to add something from Armenia. So one thing that I would like to mention was that, like, creating funny stories, because all the jokes, all the, mm, I don't know, trying to ease the situation with um, happy things, it really helped a lot, uh, both in social media and in, like, some lives. And also, I would like to say that Armenian celebrities, they really did a really good job with, like, psychological support, because they were all doing, like, free concerts, um, I don't know, some... Uh, interactions with people online, uh, lives and like everything to support uh, citizens, um, to support people with um, some warmth. So that was really nice. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, anyone else? Um, so I had mentioned before that my sister's girlfriend is an EMT and when COVID began they separated all of the firehouse um, calls from all of the medical calls so they put them in two separate houses and actually the EMTs and paramedics got a house that was very run down. Um, it basically wasn't used at all. Sometimes it would be used for volunteer calls. And um, after each call where they had contact with the patient, they needed to wash all of their gear. Um, and they had a few extra sets. But if you're doing a shift that's back to back, um, you know, you have to do things quickly. So they didn't have a washer and dryer there. And basically they would just be changing out clothes as quickly as possible and sometimes even wearing their street clothes. Um, so we reached out to Lowe's, one of the stores here, and uh, they donated a new washer and dryer completely free to the house. Um, and it was, you know, that's expensive. So it's it's made a huge difference in their ability to stop the spread of infection. That's great. Thank you. Bakir, did you want to share a South African act of kindness? Um, yeah, um, but it's just something, well, small or depending on how you look at it. Um, basically, um, our university has uh, made a plan for this um, to distribute laptops to thousands of students as well as um, oh. Um, a given data to certain students, to thousands of students who don't have um, 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 access to internet uh, so that they can do their work. Um, and I think, although event we'll eventually be billed for the, um, for the, the laptops, uh, what we can pay, I think it will be added to our student account, which means we'll be um, able to pay it when we start working. So that, I think that was uh, nice because I, me personally, um, I think in in my in my first year on university, I did I didn't I had a laptop, but from second year onwards, I didn't have one. I couldn't afford one, so um, yeah, it has it does help has helped a lot. So I think yeah, that's just what I want to say. Yeah. Just to add on to that, I believe the University of the Western Cape um, actually handed out over five thousand laptops to their students. Um, and I think that was just the initial uh, group that was able to connect online and, and let the university know that they needed that support. So um, I think that's really wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anybody else has anything they want to share, go for it now. Otherwise, um, oh, Yus, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, well, they have already said everything, but in Spain, uh, the the laptops we had also the possibility to get it from the university and then also connection if you didn't have connection at home the university uh, would provide you with connection and then 
uh, there were people who univer the university or the schools paid uh, for the meals. So they received the money to their houses just in case they couldn't like afford uh, food or something. Um, and also in um, like here, I've heard of stories of like landlords either waiving the rents for their tenants or just completely, or um, some people paying, um, paying the rent for other people. Yeah. That we didn't and have. In Spain, similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Since like since we didn't have like we couldn't really go to work, it's like a lot of people were not getting any money, so people were um, paying for other people's rents and their light bills and utilities and stuff. I think in this you know, dark time or this difficult time, it's really inspiring to hear uh, stories like this. You know, we can get a little bogged down with this, the seriousness of what's happening in the world now. So um, I think it's just really great to hear that there's still good happening out in the world. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope this conversation has helped expand your perspective on uh, the pandemic response in your own home. Um, I think Danielle was absolutely right, and, and Bakir as well. Many of us she, uh, shied away from the news as a means of sort of self-preservation um, during the lockdown and quarantine period. Uh, we knew what was going on in our immediate surroundings, but we really lost touch with a lot of the rest of the world over the last few months. Um, but I think the really amazing thing is... Uh, we can, once we start to kind of resume our daily lives and we can reach out to um, our contacts around the world, we're finding out that they have experienced many of the same things that we have as well. Um, so I, I thank you again for joining us today and I, I look forward to hearing more about your experiences in our future meetings. So with that, We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank too. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.